this week on Brub Eats World. I feel like it's because of documentaries like this and the conversations that we're all kind of having post Me Too um, that kind of encapsulates all kinds of these like secret abuses that were happening. Like these conversations will hopefully make it harder for the next generation to experience those things. So as uncomfortable as it is, it's, it's something that we kind of have to do if we want things to change because staying quiet is what led to so much of this happening. When this boy meets world what up bros what up bros <laughs> hey welcome to brown meets world when it's brown meets world your boy meets world fan cast i'm siege and i'm tony curtis and we are having a class discussion episode um Tony, tell them why we're doing this. Honestly, guys, we just saw the Quiet on Set documentary, and it was like, uh, hey, we got to call our bro mates together. You and I have to talk about it and figure yeah. out like how we feel about it. I got to be honest. I am not looking forward to this episode today. I am sweating. I feel uncomfortable. I literally just finished watching episode four like an hour ago, and like... Dude, I I don't feel good. Like I just don't feel good. Like I don't want. I, uh, I don't. Know. Well, so I will say a few things. One, um, I listened, I listened to our episode on um Pod Meets World's episode, very special episode where they kind of like got ahead of it. I watched all four episodes of Quiet on the Set. Um, I watched the response videos. I've been doing my work. I just want everyone to know that I've I've done my work, and I have a few things to say. One is a uh, way to teach me to speak before I have all the information. <laughs> I'll just say that. No, I'll say that much. Two, um, you said something in our episode that I thought was really important where you said um, a lot of nostalgia is clamoring for the idea of something and not knowing the reality. And I thought about that a lot while I was watching this documentary. And overall, I am I'm looking forward to have this conversation because I think that this is one of the best episodes I can think of in terms of holding myself accountable to the same standards that I have asked of the cast previously and not shying away from having the tough conversations uh, and, and kind of having to reexamine some of my own um my own perspectives so uh, that's how we'll start this uh, mm -hmm. but sorry you guys i know like we all hate it but we live in capitalism so we're gonna do a little bit of the housekeeping which is to say you guys a lot of you reached out to me and asked what we thought about this uh documentary what we thought about the documentary now that we uh what we thought about our response now that we have seen the documentary and I just want to say to that, uh, if you want to reach out to us, please do so at Brummies World. Um, you can email us at brummiesworld at gmail.com. You guys have been very active on YouTube, on Instagram, on our Patreon. We appreciate it always. So you guys, uh, if you're listening to this phone, go follow us on Instagram. Listening to this on your phone, follow us on Instagram. Um, and if you're watching us on YouTube or Spotify, Again, follow, subscribe. We appreciate it. Give us a rating. Now that we have done that, uh, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, as I said earlier, we are talking about Quiet on the Set, the dark side of kids' TV. Tony, why don't you give them the details of this, just so we're all on the same page? Sure, yeah. It's quick synopsis. This is a, a TV miniseries I saw on HBO Max, uh, Max, whatever you want to call it, but I think it's Discovery ID who investigated investigation discovery that aired it initially it's four episodes episode one and two premiered on march 17th and then episodes three and four premiered on march 18th of 2024 it's directed by mary robertson and emma schwartz and it features several child actors including drake bell giovanni samuels kyle sullivan katrina johnson brian hearn and several other uh industry insiders um, like I said, it's available on Max. You can also watch it on Hulu and Amazon. Uh, and for those of you who did not watch it, uh, the summary of Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids Television, is a docuseries that covers the emotional and sexual abuse suffered by child actors on Nickelodeon in the mid-90s and 2000s. Um, child pornography and sexual assault are discussed in detail. The documentary also explores the racial challenges faced by former child actors, uh, including the pressures of being the token black 
girl and dealing with racism and stereotypical roles on set. The one-on-one interviews contain sexist, sexist ling- sexual language, as well as descriptions of continual sexual assault. Both victims and their parents are shown tearing up as they recount their stories. So, first thoughts. I again, I understand that you're just out of this. What, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. first thoughts. Just first. You thoughts. know, just a few key things I want to say before we jump into the specifics. One, I've kind of been talking for a while now how I feel like nostalgia has like a good and bad side to it, and you know, I can't help but like see like how. You know, politically, America's kind of waking up to like, oh, we've kind of been fed lies. And I think as millennials, it's like as we dive into more and more subcultures, we're like, it's all kind of been bullshit. And I I have a really hard time. I had a hard time watching this documentary from the jump, like from the very first episode, because it immediately got me in with all of this classic Nickelodeon nostalgia. And to talk like I cannot downplay how important Nickelodeon was in the 90s because I mean, as the documentary says, there was two spots. There was Disney Channel, if you were lucky at first. Not even everyone had that at first, but Nickelodeon was it for us. And all of the shows that were featured, all of the shows that were discussed, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit older of a millennial, so I didn't stick around for some of the later shows that were covered in the documentary, but so many of them meant so much to me. These actors that were in the show, specifically all that and all these, like, meant so much to me, and I'm har- I was just heartbroken watching it. Um, just a few other things that I want to circle back to later, but I just want to mention the role of... Um, children supporting their families financially, I think is something I really want to kind of get to the bottom of. Um, I want to kind of talk about how capitalism, I think, plays a part in forcing artists to be uncomfortable because there's so few um, places where artists can actually make profit. So they're often the first to be compromised by situations like this. And just kind of like, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll get into it, but there were so many like in induendos and like inside jokes and like weird things that was like shoved into our entertainment as kids that I think our generation maybe normalized in a way that kind of makes us all victims of this. I, I don't know. I don't know. So I'm just kind of like swirling around all of that, you know, and, and that's not even touching the details of the documentary. But you, what are your some kind of uh, um, what are your opening impressions, your, your first thoughts? My opening impressions is, you know, I, I will take the same approach as I did previously when you were like, oh, if you found out your husband was like a murderer, you would like, you're going to tell me that you wouldn't be surprised. And I'm like, no, actually, it makes you like, you know, it's a possibility. And I look at this documentary as so upsetting, so frustrating, but also not really surprising. You know, having lived in LA, having learned a lot, like seeing kind of the double talk that LA is about and like knowing how many people are able to continue to be in positions of powers and not be good at their jobs um, and not be responsible adults, but they are money makers. That is kind of what I I, I saw going into this. Um, And then also I will say, I feel a little bit bamboozled like now that I learned a little bit more details about um, who the person was that um, Hot Meets World was kind of like covering for and yep. like their response to it and like the actual context of it, all of that is something that we will address. We will get to it. But ultimately, I look at this documentary as doing a good service. I feel like we, like both, I'm, I'm going to be honest, both. Uh, Pod Meets World's coverage and like their stories, what you and I have been doing in terms of like looking back and rewatching all these episodes and like exploring it. And then also documentaries like Quiet on the Set are all shining a spotlight on child actors and young Hollywood that I feel like is deserved. And that's how I see this. I see this as we don't know how to do better if we don't know what was wrong in the first place and hate it, love it, no matter what you feel about it, we are all better for being aware of what actually is going on. I'll I'll second that and agree by just saying that um, as I was, you know, kind of thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, one of the things I thought was, wow, 
I feel like it's because of documentaries like this and the conversations that we're all kind of having post Me Too um, that kind of encapsulates all kinds of these like secret abuses that were happening. Like these conversations will hopefully make it harder for the next generation to experience those things. So as uncomfortable as it is, it's it's something that we kind of have to do if we want things to change because staying quiet is what led to so much of this happening. So. Absolutely. Quiet on the set. Uh, it, it, it's part of that. Okay, just so to let you guys know how we're going to do this, we're going to cover it in like sections and chunks, mm -hmm. just so you like, you're all able to like follow along. We're going to cover Dan Schneider and the Nickelodeon of it all. Then we're going to talk about Drake Bell and Brian Peck. Then we're going to go into Pod Meets World and our reactions to our reaction. Uh, and then we're going to have some um, after the doc conversations and final thoughts. So starting off with like episodes one and two really are structured around Dan Schneider and his uh, tenure at Nickelodeon. Yeah. Um, this is the dude who was responsible for all that. This is the dude for the Amanda show. Um, he was Nickelodeon's golden child for a very, very long time. And there is a lot to say just in terms of the toxic work place that he had how he treated women on his staff and what the the kids who grew up working under him had to say which i honestly feel like is some of the most important things like what did the children who worked under him had to say um and so yeah that's where i want to start johnny um it's <laughs> Dan Schneider sucks, bro, because he's such <laughs> truly like he's such a huge part of children's entertainment um, that it's almost like uh, like recently, like I've been noticing how often Diddy will just hop on someone else's record being like, I thought I told you that we won't stop. And I'm like, why did you ruin this Mariah Carey song for me? Like, <laughs> like, that's what Dan Schneider is. It's like this thing where it's like. I don't know that I can go back and watch an all that episode the same way now. Like, not that I often go back, but every now and then I have a nostalgia time where I just like, oh, I want to go back and watch some childhood entertainment. All that was so important to me. It was the first time I saw, you know, diversity. The first time I saw like kids having like fun putting on the show. I actually auditioned to be in all that. Did you really? Yeah, now knowing what I know now, they were probably like, we already have a chubby black one, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually did. And I remember being obsessed with that show and wanting nothing more to be than to be a Nick kid. And like, thank God, like I it didn't happen. Like it's it's the a lot of times you like uh, I want to talk about for a second Katrina Johnson yeah, who, who worked Katrina on Katrina Johnson. You know, the show talk starts with uh Katrina, she's the youngest member of all that. And she comes on to the show and she's apparently a favorite of Dan Schneider. They talk about this throughout the series about how Dan Schneider would often play favorites and um, kind of use his position of power to be like, oh, maybe you'll get a spinoff if you're you know, nice to me or whatever, like things like that. Um, Katrina talks about how, you know, she was brought in and she was kind of a favorite of Dan until um, Amanda Bynes came along and she was kind of phased out of the show. She also talks about the role that her body played in it, like how like people were judging her for first gaining weight and then like just developing as a woman and how that affected her. Um, the reason I'm bringing up Kat Katrina Johnson is just because I specifically remember watching all that and her watching and feeling that she was getting phased out. She was a favorite character of mine in the season one. And by the time Amanda Bynes joined the show, I remember actually feeling a certain way about Amanda Bynes because I was like, oh, she's she's taken like sketches, sketch, skits from actors that I really enjoy. And I just remember her really being pushed to the forefront. And now I kind of understand why in a different way. And it's it's like the worst way to discover it. I don't know. Well, it's so it's so funny that you say that because like I I felt the exact same thing like seeing Katrina drop like again the documentary has like a lot of people from all like the original all that and like mm -hmm. you know it, it was one of Dan uh, Shiner's crowning achievements um, and he did bring like SNL to Nickelodeon um, but again a I watched it being like oh that was right. Nickelodeon was built on the backs of people of color and like all like us doing all the work and getting this there and showing that it could be done. And then years later, it completely being completely being whitewashed and it's hard pressed to find um stars and um leads of color. 
yeah uh, on nickelodeon so that, that there's just that but then also this idea that um i too remember watching katrina and her being the star and her being like in a lot of skits and everywhere and then all of a sudden like it's funny i was, i even remember her developing but not like in like a weird way like yeah just, oh she got she older. got older and then amanda coming on and me being like i I'm not fucking with Amanda, you know, like, like, well, I was she was, like uh, to be all fair, like, to be fair to Amanda Bynes, she was the first new cast member that was brought on. So, like, it wasn't like a tradition the way it is now, where, like, every season there's new cast members. Like, she was the first time that someone, like, new got added to the cast. So it felt a little odd. Well, yeah, I, well, I think the thing with me with Amanda, which is what you were talking about, is that I just uh, originally remember as a child being like, you feel like a plant, you know, like, mm-hmm. it's like you feel like I'm being told I have to like you. And while I do love some of your bits, I also feel like you're going for a different tone of comedy and that you are, you're becoming the Urkel, which is makes sense. Cause they ended up giving Amanda her own spinoff. But like, I just remember being like, Oh, I liked it best when it was an ensemble. And then when you got pulled out and you got made the star, I felt differently. So anyway, all of this is like that we're talking about, um, all that, but I want to say that I also pulled out the idea and noted that um, Johnson had said that she began to gain weight and she was favorite when she was young, and then she started to develop. And I was like, oh, all of these like little things. And I think one of the most important things to me about this entire documentary is the idea that a lot of what is being said and a lot of what is happening isn't like hard evidence yeah. like someone could say that you're speculate like it's speculation but when they all add up you're like no nah, something was going on here you know can i just i want to interject that because i felt like there was a lot of moments where that was the case where it was like this is gray this is murky and if i were trying to report someone who was doing this maybe as a child i wouldn't have the language to do so I want to talk about I want to I don't want to move on from Amanda Bynes too quickly because I want to say this. First of all, I as an adult can now see how talented she was. When they're showing her doing a stand-up routine at like the comedy club when she was like 12, I was just like, oh, she is incredibly talented. Like when they showed the clips of her, I'm like, wow, what a bright comedic light who had such natural talent. And you know, to to see the way that all of her the way she was treated, to see the way it affected her, like truly breaks my heart. I just want to say this about Amanda Bynes. There's a moment in the documentary, I forget if it's episode one or two, where they're saying, Amanda joined the show and the cast would be hanging out on all that, but we couldn't find Amanda because she'd be disappeared with Dan alone for hours and hours or we couldn't find her. And I'm like, see, that's some shit that actually is not a gray area. There is no reason why... Amanda should be alone with Dan Schneider. And I understand that, like, as the documentary is going on, they're like, hey, it's a- it was actually quite common for adults to be left alone with children. But, like, for someone of his position to spend that much time with her, I don't want to, like, bring in a lot of, like, external information because we are talking about this documentary specifically. But there is this thing that's going around about how Amanda Bynes had, like, a f- a fake Twitter account, like a Twitter account that was her own after her parents like basically took over her Twitter account and wouldn't let her post on it, where she mentions uh, uh, getting impregnated and having an abortion by a boss of hers. Yeah, And so it's like, I know she didn't tell her story in this, but it feels like there's so much more to the Amanda Bynes-ness of why Dan Schneider is a piece of shit. Like, it all comes back to Dan Schneider being a piece of shit, but I feel like Amanda Bynes plays a way bigger part in that than was actually even discussed in this documentary. So I just I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think also, like, so for me, I think that you can tell just in the way that Dan Schneider is talked about, there were two things that stood out to me. One is this man got off on power plays. Yes. And he got off on making people do uncomfortable things. Like that, and that is like whether it's children and forcing them to be in situations that they don't want to be in, whether it's uh colleagues and people who work for him putting them in situations where they didn't want to, like he got off on, there was like the editor who talks about how she would work 20 hour days and not be allowed to go to the bathroom. And I, and I was like, oh, that's a power play. 
Like, yeah. That's what that is. That's just the power play. That's being like, I hold your well-being in my life. You yep. can't leave this room unless I say you can. And again, having women uh, massage him on set. Um, that's that. Those are power moves. Those are just yep. a way of saying, hey, I want everyone in this room to know that I have the power and everything lives and dies by my opinion. And I, I think that that is so important because it kind of bleeds into everything else. A hundred percent. And the power play of it, like it was such a, like the way he would fuck with his crew members, the way he would like, you know, do these like inappropriate jokes that like they had to go along with. They they tell a story about one of the female writers um, being in the writer's room and Dan goes up to her and says, hey, I want you to pretend to be sodomized as a joke. It would be funny. Her doing it and being humiliated and eventually like leaving because it, like I just the humiliation that some of these female crew members had to go through in order to just have job security is really striking. Um, even these female writers who were told that they had to split their salaries in order to work for Dan, like, I truly just don't think this motherfucker likes women. And I think part of that has to do with, he doesn't want people calling him out. And I feels like, it feels like he feels like he has more control when it's a guy's room where he can like joke around and be like, oh yeah, I may have said something inappropriate, but you know, the guys know it's just a joke. And like, you're not gonna be one of those girls that are gonna be a problem, are you? Like that shit is like, it's toxic, but knowing who Dan is, it's also like, he wants yes men. He wants people who aren't going to bring up issues. He wants people who aren't going to be a problem. You know, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but, you know, in all that in the later seasons, there's an actor named Brian Hearn. Yep. Who his mom saw some shit and said some shit, and then he wasn't invited back. And, like, it obviously has... Uh, had lasting impact on him as an actor and his relationship with his mom even was kind of in trouble for a while. But like the one person who did stand up was a woman, a black woman at that I'll say, and they removed her. So yep. it's, it's just one of those things where it was like, um, I just don't think he liked having women around because of the accountability that brought. This is not to say that anyone is required to do this. I will say, but it is funny to me because I was watching this and I knew immediately I was like, Oh, Brian Hearn's mom is she's the real one she like yeah. the reason they were like oh dan always kind of like kept uh brian at a distance like a lot of the black characters not characters a lot of the black cast members said that they felt like dan played favorites that he always distanced himself from them and i was like that's because black people are more likely like black children are more likely to tell their parents and black people are more likely to say something yep. and not go quietly into that night and i think like there's a lot of that this is not to say that anyone uh else's parents who didn't come forward um didn't have their own reasons for not to i think it's really sad when you get the representation of so many parents who like whose children were abused and how they react to it and i was like to your point, A, capitalism being a really big part of this. A lot of people, a lot of kids are paying for their families to get out of wherever they wanted to be. But also this idea of what society will say. And I will say that, I'll say this, in the Black community, what society will say is, did you protect your child? Yeah. <laughs> but... In other communities, that's not necessarily the case. It is a blame game. It is like a, what were you doing? What was going on? And you have to keep up appearances, especially well, if money is on the line. Let me just throw this in here real fast. It wasn't included in the documentary, but I later found this out on TikTok. Uh, just speaking of like, um, you know, we were talking about the Black community, even Shelby Wu. I don't know if you remember that show. The yeah. Mystery Files of Shelby Wu. She posted a TikTok saying... Um, when you speak up against the creepy things that happen and you get replaced by another Asian actress on your own show. Wow. And I'm just like, oh, so this was everywhere. Like there's like the documentary is the tip of the iceberg to everything that was going on. Yeah. Do you know the show Just Jordan? Mm -mm. All right. It was a Nickelodeon show starring Lil JJ was his name. Okay. Um, and the whole reason I'm saying it is like someone pulled up a tweet where just Jordan or Lil JJ said something along the lines of this was years ago, even before the documentary came out. He said something along the lines of my show got canceled because I refused to 
serve people <laughs> as a child. And like, those are not the words he, he said. If you want to look, go Google it. But basically, yeah, he was like, oh, that's why. Like people were coming after me. There were predators um, on set and I refused to give in to that. And so my show was canceled. Yeah. And the number of people who are um, punished for speaking up, like, again, you had talked about it earlier, the one of the writers who found out that they were being underpaid and filed a complaint only for Dan to call her and basically threaten and say, That's not only if I find out it's you, not only will you lose this job, you will never work at Nickelodeon or any Viacom project. Which yeah. That was really important. Um, you, you know, I, one of the things that really bothered me about the Dan Schneiderness of it, and it kind of relates to Brian Peck. Well, I know we're going to get to him separately, but was this idea of like, hey, it's going to be really funny if we're able to sneak in like adult comedy and adult visuals into a children's show. And I feel like that was like a little inside haha joke that like him and Brian and like other people like really got off on now, in terms of like that power play just being like oh not only is this gonna like scratch my own little fetish but like i can get away with it and like pursuing that and like that would just feel so malicious to me and it also like i said at the at the top of the episode about how like i feel like we're all kind of victims of this because this is the content that we were fed as children thinking like oh this is how kids are where it's like no kids aren't constantly putting things in their mouth are getting like things sprayed on their face or like having their feet on the online like it's just it's all weird it's all weird well so that's funny it's funny that you say that because like i remember even as a kid i was like oh i don't find this funny and people mm -hmm. will go back and look and it's funny because we're there i'm gonna get back to it in general but dan and dan schneider's response he said things like along the lines of Every joke was run by a committee. Every mm -hmm. joke was like had a writer's room. Every joke had parents on set and blah, 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 blah. And A, that does not take accountability for the power play, which is what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And B, just because something made it through, you and I have watched several episodes and we were like, this is not funny. What are we doing? Like, just yep. because it made it through does not mean that it was okay. Just because at the time no one brought it up. Like, we also live in a machine where they're like, did you create the content? Did, yeah. did that happen? Do we, like you said, there's a lot of living in that gray area. This show, our Dan Schneider's productions love to live in that gray area and of sexualization. And you have to ask yourself why. Why is there a glory hole joke in this um, kid's cartoon? Why is there... Um, Penises on this kid's costume. Like, well, crazy like, shit. Also, like, the idea of, like, constantly putting the kids in spandex and superhero costumes it's like yeah no it's it's fine for a sketch but why are you constantly doing it like that's well, the frequency that's also the problem that and like one of the things i didn't really notice until i started watching it because like i said a, a lot of the older Nick, like i stopped watching nickelodeon around like what probably around 9 11 like it, it like it wasn't really something yeah. i carried on i had moved on to mtv and kind of more adult stuff at that time but when I see clips of like Victorious and iCarly and Zoe 101, I'm like, wow, they've really had these girls in bikinis and shit. Like they really had them in like skimpy like outfits. And I'm just like, I don't remember that being a thing when I was like, I remember Alex Mack wearing like baggy jeans. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it, it was just a completely different way to showcase children. And one of the writers or someone said like um oh dan would use these girls bodies as like a marketing tactic too and i'm just like for a 12 year old like it's yeah, just, it's, yeah. it's 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 weird it's just very weird so well i think i'm i'm gonna say because you and i have talked about this before specifically at the time i think we were dealing with a lot of immaturity uh immature men at that mm -hmm. time. late 90s early 2000s if you look at the comedy it is a lot of uh, arrested development you have the sure. role um Farrell's, the uh, Adam Sandler's, like all of this comedy was really, really childish, really, really gross, but grown men doing it. Yep. And it was accepted at the time. I think like that cast of Hollywood thought that this was funny and that this was edgy and that this was acceptable. And as we've gotten older, it's like, no, that all of it, all of it was inappropriate. Um... Inappropriate and also like the lowest hanging fruit. The comedy does not translate because it was such an easy joke that's distasteful. 
absolutely. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about a few things. One, the Amanda of it all, to see the amount of access that Dan Schneider was able to have with Amanda, the video of him in the hot tub, and she is saying, hey, this was your idea. Like she, like, it's, it's so funny to like, look at these things and just like kind of casually be like, oh, wait a minute, this person saw talent and is kind of grooming it in a way to where this child would not know to say something. It makes me feel really bad for the way her story turned out Mm -hmm. because there are so many demons that she obviously was facing, but to see that amount of talent I don't want to say go to waste, but kind of be corrupted by an older man. It's just something I wanted to acknowledge and like really put out there. And then I want to talk about the other uh, yeah. pedophiles that were were notified on set. Before we move on from Amanda, just something I want to say, like when you're talking about seeing her talent, like I truly, when I was watching her clips, I was like, wow, she, the closest thing I can relate her to when she was like in her prime is like Lucille Ball, like her comedic timing, her physical comedy, the way she would give her all to a joke. I'm like, wow, what a star she was like truly a star. And we talk a lot about like sexual abuse. We talk a lot about how like, um, there was the kind of aggression that would happen from Dan about him just snapping or yelling or humiliating people. The other thing about Dan is that he saw Amanda as his meal ticket out of children's entertainment. That he tried to attach himself to her as she, you know, he created what I like about you. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Until watching this. So like he really was trying to hang on to her for as long as possible. And it wasn't until she kind of fell through his grips that he returned to children's entertainment and it, it's just interesting that like there there's there's financial exploitation happening with dan as well not just all the other kinds of abuse yeah again power wherever power is mm-hmm. um we are again i want to talk about some of the other things i will say it is complex because the documentary very very rightfully explores the fact that um it is not just dan schneider there were other people who were predators who were allowed to be on set and interact with children. And one of the things that I think is most telling is there's the example of Jason Handy, I think it is. Jason Handy, Jason Hardy. Um, he is That's a tough a, one for me. Honestly, he, Jason's a hard one. Yeah, he was someone who was allowed to basically take children from their parents alone and he was a PA. He was set. a PA yeah. on set. He was in charge of directing the kids where to go. He was also in charge of like organizing things with the mothers and like how like the parents could be with the kids. He played a key role in that. And I'm not going to say that that isn't a role that like a young man shouldn't have. I am yeah. going to say that we should, in fact, be mindful of who is being alone with children mm-hmm. and at what point in time and how long. I cannot express this enough. I do not like being alone with children ever at all. Yeah. Like, I'm like, why? <laughs> Cause I was like, I have no reason to be around kids. It doesn't make sense. So for him and specifically, be- like with a kid one-on-one, like why aren't there other kids around to, you know, that kind of thing. Well, uh, yeah, there's that. And then the idea of him giving his information to the kid and the kid and him are emailing. And just like, again, before we even go into of like what actually happens i just want to say that i i want to be understanding of um one of the children who was abused her name was brandy and one of the things about brandy's mom who is really vocal in this is she kind of like ignored the signs and i just want to say that that's the thing that i'm having a hard time with it is not that i expect parents to know everything that's going on with their children It is when you hear that your child is messaging with an adult consistently, what's that about? You know, like there has to be some kind of like something goes off. Brandy's mom, who's called MJ in this, I just have to say, like, I don't know who's listening that has relationships to her and no disrespect to her. Fuck MJ, because (laughs) not only did she know that her like eight year old, like below like nine year old was constantly messaging this guy. She, Jason sent Brandy a photo of him naked, explicit, being explicit, saying like, basically saying like, hey, I want you to know I was thinking about you as he was naked. 
The mom saw this and her first thought was, well, if I call police, they're going to think I'm a bad mom. And that's that was the moment I was like, fuck you, MJ. <laughs> like this, the fact that you care more about what other people think about you versus protecting your daughter or helping protect other children from this man who has access to children is is there's no excuse for it like there you can't like i don't know it, it, to me that's probably what it, like the the parents in some way are complicit in this and somehow in the way that they've allowed not all parents like there's some great parents drake's dad i think is a great parent like there's so many aspects of like parents who really showed up but to see that sent to your kid and think about well what about what are people going to think of me is i really lost it at that to your point, A, that was definitely one of my things. And I think that this is important because this is why I very often advocate for speaking up and doing what's right, even in the face of what other people might think, because the first reaction being, well, they're going to think I'm a bad mom. Well, they're going to, it's like your first reaction, your, your priority should be to protect your child and to protect other people's children. The fact that you didn't say anything, the fact, like that's what I have a problem with. Like if you see something, the see something, say something, the thing is, even if it's not the cops, because don't get me wrong, cops, who knows how they would have handled it, but you definitely should have said something. You definitely should have made record. You definitely should have, like they are talking about, uh, it's so funny, Brian, talks about how he didn't tell his mom certain things because he knew how his mom would react. And I was mm. like, but what we don't know as children is that's your parents trying to protect you. Sure. And, like the, the, and I think that it's important to note that the cases where the parents are involved in this documentary, they also are removed. They exactly. are removed. And I think that that also should be very telling when you have a child who, for all intents and purposes, doesn't is not being abused at home they mm -hmm. seem to have a caring parents. If you if someone at work is trying to remove those parents from the picture, you have to ask yourself why. Remove the parents and also disrupt the relationship between the child and the parent that happened with Brian and his mom. It also happened with Drake and his dad in terms of like, while, you know, the the parent that's causing the issue is it's almost like the predator knows to like insert themselves in between um, in a way that's really like hard to grapple with that. They're like, Oh, I'm going to go as far as to like break up your relationship with your parents so I can get more access to you. Dan did the same thing with Amanda and her emancipation. Like it, and it wasn't until her emancipation got declined that he lost access to Amanda. So it was things like that, where it's just like, man, these people will really kind of try to remove a child from their parents for their own perversions. Th to that point, um, you made me think of like the red flags that should go off mm -hmm. um and we're we're gonna get into it next um but one of the things that really bothered me with the parents is the episode starts to go into brian peck and with brian peck he was someone he is the person that will and Ryder were talking about in their episode where they talked about um, befriending and being friends with a groomer, with someone who is a convicted sex offender, and how they came to his side. We will get to that, I promise you. But what's also important to me is there are red flags that I am so curious as to how people ignored. Yeah. When Kyle Sullivan talks about he went to their house, he went to uh, Brian Peck's house, and Brian Peck had a photo of John Wayne Gacy. It was and, a self-portrait. It was a painting. Yes. It, he... And then Brian Peck says, A, I got that from the man himself. B, we're pen pals. C, we continue to talk to each other to this day. And D, I am proudly telling you this story. This is not something that you got out of me. This is not something that they discovered after the fact. This was something that he told people at a party. He, <laughs> he had later revealed that he's become pen pal friends with John Wayne Gacy and has a slew of letters that he keeps by his bed. Can I just asterisk this real <laughs> fast, just for the for people who don't know, because this actually came up. John Wayne Gacy was a serial killer who dressed up like a clown and molested boys. So like for that to be the dude that Brian's like, oh, I talk to him all the time. 
And all these adults heard it and were just like, huh, that's weird. We got to ask more questions. Absolutely. Like, uh, there are a few things. The reason why I brought this up, one, you made a reference to John Wayne Gacy in our previous episode that I thought was, like, you just did it. And you were like, like, what if, like, John Wayne Gacy had? And so the idea that it, like, came back in this documentary was, like, so crazy to me. But also, it is one of the clearest ideas of sometimes the problem can be staring you in the face Mm -hmm. and people will walk right by. Like, I can't, that if someone, like, we're, we're very familiar that if someone, like, has Nazi paraphernalia, mm-hmm. or, you know, like, if there's, like, it's very clear if you are looking and you're willing to pay attention, and I can't stop, I can't stop thinking about how much of this is just fueled by money and our dependency on our jobs and mm-hmm. the idea that so many parents, so many people are forced to look past obvious red flags in order to make ends meet. Um, Just something I want to say while we're on the story about Brian's house party that he threw, uh, something that like he shares, a quality he shares with Dan Schneider is this arrested development thing. Is this, I'm a big kid in like an adult body so much so that both of them, their homes were kind of decorated to be kind of like children play areas. And people would say the same thing about Michael Neverland. And this is kind of what I was talking about in terms of how nostalgia sometimes can get dangerous because it can keep you locked into a mindset that you are actually younger than you are. And if Brian is walking around surrounded by toys from his childhood, this motherfucker could convince himself that he is a peer and an equal to someone that's younger than him. And I'm not saying that nostalgia is innately dangerous, but I just think it's interesting that when you see these stories come out of men after men after men, a lot of them have fascinations with childhood shit. And so it's just, that's just something that I keep seeing and I, I'm trying to figure out in my own head. Well, now we're getting to the drink of it all because I thought, like when you said they have interest in childlike shit, I think that it is not to say that anyone who has interest in child like things sure. are a problem, but it is to say that you have to ask why. What is mm-hmm. what is their relationship with this thing? Because even Drake talks about the episode um goes and it talks about, hey, we had Jason Hardy who was convicted of doing inappropriate things. And then later there was a second predator who um named Brian Peck. He abused someone. Does anyone know who that person is? And then the big reveal is it's Drake Bell from Drake and Josh. And then Drake comes and he's telling his story for the very first time. And what I thought was interesting about Drake, when he tells the story of how he met Brian, he talks about how Brian shared interests with him (laughs) and how much they had in common. And he goes, now that I think about it, that was probably intentional. And yeah. that's my thing is like these people had interest in childlike things, but they also use that interest to get children to trust them because shared experiences, shared interest is the greatest mm-hmm. way to get close to someone. Sure. Um, I The Brian Peck Drake sections of this were some of the hardest to watch just being real um i i mean it kind of just starts with just kind of showcasing brian's role and nickelodeon and how uh you know he would pop up on different shows he was pickled guy which was all like phallic jokes nonstop. um he also has a history in Hollywood that extends beyond his relationship with Dan Snyder and Nickelodeon, where he was on Growing Pains. He was on Boy Meets World. He was on all these other shows. And like when you, uh, you know, later on, they kind of talk about all the people that were supporting him. You see that, you know, some of these people have just been in Hollywood for a long time and he's been included into a group. And it's almost as if like, that mindset of like, oh, hey, you're new to Hollywood. You and your parents don't know anything about this. I know this. You can trust me. If you want to be successful, follow me. Specifically, your parents. Yeah, your your dad does this. He doesn't know anything about Hollywood. Like taking advantage of people who don't know Hollywood and using that to your advantage was something that clearly happened from this guy who was so clearly in- integrated into all of these shows, even beyond Nickelodeon. Yeah, the thing about Brian Peck that I find very um, disturbing, besides the fact that, you know, the John Wayne Gacy of it all, is this idea of 
everyone being like, oh, he was a dialect coach. However, he was everywhere. He's always around. He's like, and I don't, I don't know the industry that well. I don't know what dialect coaches do, but it did seem that he like took an interest mm -hmm. in certain kids, specifically with Drake Bell. Yep. Drake's dad talks about how he was just able to see things and be like, mm -hmm. yo, this is unnatural. And everyone else dismissing it. And I think that's the thing. It's like, so often when you're in workplaces, if someone raises a red flag, a lot of people, specifically groups of men, if they don't agree with it or if they don't have the experience themselves, mm -hmm. you're so quick to dismiss it. It's yeah. why women have such a hard time being able to flag um, sexual harassment or harassment of any kind or being misheard. It's like when someone complains about a dude and another dude doesn't have the same negative experience it's so easy for people to overlook and that really makes me upset because it's very clear that anyone who's willing to actually listen to someone's concerns could see it like drake's girlfriend's mom they were like oh no no she got it immediately it took her like 90 seconds to be like something's not right about this yeah i um oh yeah. I can't help but to wonder, like, did Ryder Strong get shown these John Wayne Gacy letters? Did Will Friedle see this painting? Like, I know that this, I know we're going to get there, but like, these are some of the questions, like, as I'm hearing these things about Brent, I'm like, well, yeah, you might not have known the specifics of what happened between him and Drake, but like, you knew this motherfucker, right? Like, you hung out with him. Ryder talks about being good friends with him. So I'm just wondering, like, not even just them, like, of all the adults that were around, like, all of these blues clues are around and no one's putting them together. And I'm just yeah. like, like it, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that it took this for this to happen. Whereas, you know, there were so many signs that could have prevented this from even happening. Yeah. So um, what we're talking about this even happening, for those of you who didn't watch, uh, Drake Bell comes on and he talks, he tells his story of like being in Hollywood, wanting to be an actor, getting kind of like small breaks and then like his big break, being on the Amanda show. From the Amanda show, they um, see that he and um, Josh Peck have chemistry and they want to like do a spinoff for it. So like all of that is going on in the meantime, um, Drake's dad is being ostracized because Drake's dad is constantly being like, there is something going on inappropriate between Brian Peck and my kid. And they essentially blackball his dad from being on set. But also, and then Brian Peck talks to Drake and is trying to like, Put in a wedge between that mm -hmm. they get the mom to have i guess custody of drake and the dad is like you know what that's fine if that's what you want to do do it however keep him away from brian and what does she do instead she allows brian to take over the role of his father and because one thing to point out is that drake openly said that like his mom lived in orange county she yeah. lived like hour like if you don't know orange county from la it's like it can be a two-hour drive like Correct. it's not something that you can just do like consistently every day specifically if you're a parent or if you have a kid that needs to go around the auditions or whatever so she would depend on brian to be his la chauffeur he would spend the night at brian's house brian would take him to auditions and all these things and at a certain point it was there were no other adults around but right. Brian. So not only did Brian make himself so important to Drake's career, one thing I, another thing I want to point out is that at the time that this abuse was happening, the idea of a Drake and Josh show was not fully there yet. It was hanging Correct. in the balance, almost as if like someone knew that like this was a very sensitive time for this actor that he wouldn't want to mess up his career. And if I had any impulses, now is the time to strike because the fact that all of this happened before he even shot the pilot for Drake and Josh, and he was still like hoping that his career wouldn't get ruined. Like all of that shit just feels so purposeful from Brian's perspective of just like, you know, now is the time where this kid has almost the most dependency on me more than ever. Absolutely. And the idea that Brian would just show up everywhere. And I think that's really important because first of all, um, Drake tells a story about how Brian would just show up to his concerts. He would just show up at random things. And like things are, as you said, it's like he would show up in like San Diego and you live in LA and why are you at a kid's concert with friends in San Diego? Or he received birthday cards that seemed kind of inappropriate 
And his dad would be like, what are these? And so, again, like the signs, the signs, the signs. And, but instead the mom gives over control or like access to Brian for Drake. And then of course, inappropriate behavior happens and kind of circling back. And I apologize, um, but circling back to it, in writer's letter, he talks about how Brian can't do it. Brian's a great guy. He shows up to support me in everything that I do. He's always there. And I was like, it's funny because in reality, what you are testifying to be supportive that this couldn't have happened is actually showing that it could have happened to you. (laughs) Like, Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, Brian developing close relationships with people like Ryder Strong or Kirk Cameron or Leonardo DiCaprio shows that this dude has a type. Honestly, like if more than anything, that's what I kind of got away from it was that he constantly got close to these like teen heartthrobs in a way. Like I know that's kind of weird thing to say, but yeah, I think it's important. The young boys of it all is what's bothering to me. Because Drake was 14 at the time that this happened. Drake was 14 at the time that uh, it started 15 when it was reported. There's there's so much that's going on to it. But I say all this to say that, as you were saying, uh, Leo DiCaprio, Ryder Strong, uh, Drake Bell, these are young men who Brian had an interest in and who was showing up and being there for all the time. And to me, that should be, like, if this man's circle are young men all, then that's weird. Like, yeah. why are you hanging around children? Again, I am hard pressed to know children of any kind and let alone ones I'm not related to, let alone ones that I would go out of my way to see and be a part of their lives on a regular basis. Now that is me, that's my experience. If you sure. feel differently, um, that's one thing. But like, if this man is showing up to everyone and every every young man, that he has, and this man does not run a a boys and girls club. <laughs> yep. Why is he there? Why why is all of this happening? Um, you know, we're we're giving uh okay, so j- just to quickly summarize this, uh Drake is spending all this time at Brian's house. Slowly abuse starts to happen. At first, Brian is very apologetic, says it's never gonna happen again. I don't know what came over me. Then it just kind of continues and escalates to the point where Drake is physically uncomfortable, but he doesn't know how to separate himself from Brian. So he starts dating this girl and starts spending all of his time at his girlfriend's house. And we're called out a lot of parents that were real ones. This girlfriend's mom was a real one because what she saw was a 40 plus year old man, 42 42 year old man calling a 16 year old, 17 year old boy nonstop, a 15 year old boy nonstop all day at multiple numbers trying to get a hold of him she saw that and within like he said like immediately she was able to be like this isn't right and i'm just like yeah like i just feel like any any parent would right like i don't know I feel well like, not any parent would we've shown yeah, this yeah 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 i i, I don't want to i don't know if this goes into maternal or paternal instincts or maybe this just goes into awareness and education like maybe some parents just had more awareness and education towards these things but it's just it's it's interesting that it took his girlfriend's mom to step in where his mom didn't i think it has to do a lot with as you said awareness mm-hmm. and just like really examining relationships like again why are why is this 42 year old man hanging out with Mm -hmm. but definitely calling this child at this frequency that's not your daddy like you know like that's that's what it's one of those things it's just like you need to examine you need to ask yourself why and i think a lot of people aren't asking themselves why and again i also think it's really really important to note that the ones that do are also pushed to the side i just really want to want to bring that um, now we get to the fact that Brian is uh, arrested, mm-hmm. he is convicted, and then he goes on this campaign where he is telling, like, Will and Ryder talk about this. They talk about the fact that he is going around and he's telling people, hey, this is this is the part that is, I'm so sorry, everyone, it's hard for me to talk about, but he goes around and he's telling everyone, hey, I found myself in a situation, according to Will and them, Will and Ryder say that he says, you know how certain men date young women? Well, I was dating this young man 
and he came on to me and it was a moment of weakness and you know I'm gay and my options are limited and this kid also is gay and he came on to me and then something happened and now he's reporting uh, sexual harassment and our sexual assault and I was like at first you and I talked about this you and I talked about this very specifically because Will and Ryder Will says he was 19 he uses the phrase 19 and maybe he was 19 when he met Brian Peck but yeah. Will was 27 when this is all going down Yeah, he's a 27 year old man and Drake Bell is 15. At the time of the trial, Drake Bell is 18 and Will is 29, I believe. But point being is we are talking about someone in their late 20s. And their comparison, the opposition is a 15, 16 year old man. Boy. Yeah. I honestly like this is the part where it's like it gets really it gets really hard because Yes, if you listen to the Pod Meets World episode, they discuss how, you know, Brian w- gave them misinformation and in many ways kind of brought them into his abuse in various ways. But it is really hard to think that, you know, anyone could say, well, yeah, I mean, that 14 year old was coming on to him. So what was he supposed to do? Or like, well, yeah, he did it, but he's not going to do it again. And it's like, well, I I just I don't know how you overlook that. And like, I. I I I re-listened to their Pod Meets World episode, yep. and I was just like, I still don't, I still don't know if this is enough to like get the smoke off of you guys. And I know that like, you know, there's a lot of like personal feelings of them feeling like they were victimized, but it's to see that an actual victim. And I I mean I mean I'll say this: the documentary goes on to talk about the actual trial, yeah, in which like. Drake says, you know, I came into the hearing and my side really just had me and my mom and the other side was filled with all of these Hollywood insiders there to support Brian. And the comments that me and my mom were making were basically like, you know, you guys are all here to support this dude. But anytime I think of him, I'm going to think of this abuse that happened to me. The exact quote is, and I I wanted to, because it was such an impactful. Mm -hmm. Drake Bell says, you will forever have the memory of sitting in this courtroom and defending this person and I'll forever have the memory of the person you're defending violating me yeah. and doing unspeakable acts and crimes. And that's what I'll remember. And that is so impactful yeah. because it really does show, A, to me, it kind of gives me a little bit more context into Will's stance and writer's position when that episode came out. Yeah. Um. Because absolutely, as Drake said, it's like, that's their memory. Their memory is being in the courtroom. And that's the other part of me that has a problem with what I heard in their original episode is they were in the courtroom. You're not Mm -hmm. talking about someone in theory. Like you could say that you wrote a letter of support and then like you never met the person. You didn't have the specifics. But when you know that it was a child, when you go and you see that it's a young person, how do you not rec- recant your statement? I I I mean, to give the Pod Meets World guys a little bit of um understanding, they there is a moment in their com- uh, conversation where they talk about actually being in the hearing and then kind of getting that hit of reality of just being like, what the fuck am I doing here or whatever. Um, I just it's hard when the damage is already done. Like it's hard to like, honestly read the letters that Will and Ryder wrote for him. And I'm sure there was misinformation, but I just don't know how much misinformation you could do to spin something like this. Like really, like we don't know when the letters were written compared to when the hearing happened. There's so much we don't know, but the optics aren't great. The optics don't look good. The optics are not great. And I I want everyone to know, like, first of all, I've already reached out to Jensen and I've already told him that we wanted to ask him these questions. If we go to the season four recap and we do not ask him any questions, know that it was not because we did not want to. Yeah. Um, we I, I have questions. I feel like it's our responsibility as the voice of the fans to say something. So if we don't say something, know that it was not because we chickened out. I just want yeah. to put that out there. That's number one. Number two is I stand by my statement of it is good for Will and Ryder to have come on and say, hey, we supported someone we should not have. 
we did not have all the information at the time. We were biased towards our relationship with him. I'm with you. I I feel like I stand by that in a way, specific certain ways, uh, Ryder was definitely someone who didn't have people telling him your maturity is not at like all encompassing. Well, like, I also feel that Ryder was probably more groomed than Eric, than Will was. Co- correct. And I completely agree with that. And so because of that, I do have, I still have empathy and sympathy for both of them because we don't know that relationship. And by the way, I don't know when the letters were written. I don't know all of the conversations that were had. What I do know is this man had a signed photograph of John Wayne Gacy that he was proud to share. Yeah. I do know that the defendant was a 15-year-old man and that Brian Peck admitted to the things that were in the lawsuit, which include... Um, well, he admitted to two counts, so I don't know what two counts he agreed to, but some of the things that he was accused of were like brutal, violent acts, a, a sexual acts. Well, sexual acts, but no matter what, he admitted to, yeah. whether it's a peck on the cheek... Uh, a massage or whatever it is. He admitted to being a 42 year old man who had relationship and inappropriate relationship with a 15 year old child. And that is where I, I just gotta like, dude, you gotta, you gotta be like, Hey, (laughs) you know, I, here's the thing I try to do because when you watch the documentary, one of the things that's really interesting is that Drake goes on to say that, like, after all this happened, the one person who was kind of there for him was Dan Schneider, which yep. kind of lets you know, like, how confusing it can be for children to be thrown into situations like that and how confusing it could be for young people. Um, again, I know Ryder was a little bit younger, so maybe he falls into that category. One of the things I looked up that I just thought was interesting, did you know that... um the uh, Violence Against Women Act, which is the law that per, like basically was trying to help with domestic violence issues, didn't pass until 1994. Yeah. Like in terms of like, hey, there's something going on at my home that's violent. Um, we were as a society taught to not talk about that outside of the house. Yeah. And I'm not saying that like by the time this happened in the mid 2000s, we hadn't moved past that. But I do think there were generations of people who were raised with that mindset of like, yeah, I saw this at home, but I'm not going to say anything. And I, how that can kind of translate to like the workplace or other people's homes and things like that. I, I, I'm trying to empathize with everyone as much as I can, but it's just like my stomach is still churning. Like I had nightmares last night. Like this is, this is gross. Like I feel gross and I don't feel like there's any way to kind of like paint a good picture for anyone. Truly. I, and I think one of my things, one of my responsibilities is that I am not responsible for painting a good picture. Mm-hmm. I think that um, with everything, life is complex. I think that people mm-hmm. um, are allowed to do good work and also make decisions that you would not agree with. I feel like it is very right to ask. I feel like I feel like Drake Bell, whose response to uh, Boy Meets World and Will and Writers um, pod episode was like oh this is a pr stint i feel like that's fair for drake to say actually hold on give me give me a second because i actually want to read uh his response because um this is what drake posted on the pod meets world instagram in response to the episode he said will was 27 years old and brian told him what he what he did many turned away and said no i won't write a letter but they did will was not manipulated brian admitted to him and he wrote the letter anyway. Then he worked with me on many, many episodes of Spider-Man years later and never said a word to me about it. This is because they were told the letters were going to be made public. Everyone thought the letters would be sealed forever and no one would ever see them. This is their publicist telling them to get ahead of the story. Again, Drake obviously is still very hurt by this. So I don't, I, again, I don't know how accurate that is to Will and Ryder's perspective of it, but that's how the victim feels about it. And so it's important to kind of throw that out there. Another asterisk I want to put on all of this is that what Drake went through, as heartbreaking as it was, also does not excuse his behavior later in life when he gets caught, you know, eliciting, uh, you know, uh, underage uh, minor. So 
cycles of abuse obviously are terrible, but like one abuse does not excuse another. So I Thank just wanted you. to throw that up. I love that you brought that up. And the reason, the, what I wanted to say is, uh, A, I feel like Drake is valid to be like, hey, I have yet to receive an apology. Yeah. Because and... I feel like that's what was the point of that was like, hey, I worked with you, bro, and you never even said anything to me about it. Yeah. Correct. Like, and again, to me, have your apology be as loud as your violation. You know, mm. like that's how I feel truly and yeah. deeply. And then also this idea that um, I feel like Will may have a specific feeling about it because Will very proud, proudly in his letter says, hey, I like Brian so much, I've taken him from place to place from job to job, I gave him access to more things. How could I possibly like not think that this is a good man if I'm bringing him anywhere? And there is this idea of, oh, I gave him more access to Sure. Him. And, and also that like this thing where like, people often are quick to question someone else over their own judgment. So it's almost that thing of like, it's not that I didn't question this person or I didn't think this person was weird. I just trusted myself and my gut instincts so much that I don't, I, I believe I would have been able to figure out that situation through instinct versus, you know, what was happening. Absolutely. Um, so that is kind of like the summary of what was going on. Again, the heck is, the thing that I also want to talk about is the idea that Peck is convicted. He's sent to jail for 16 months. That is not enough. Like, I'm so upsetting that that is Ups where we're at. And continue to work on children's programming afterwards. What the fuck are we doing that this dude was on Sweet Life as Zach and Cody? I have said continuously that I find it so upsetting that they gave him Zach and Cody, another show with two young boys. You don't even give him Hannah Montana. You don't yeah. even give him, like, you didn't even, like, go outside of what he was accused for. You went to the direct thing that he was violated for, and then they said that they asked him about it, and he was like, oh, it's handled. It's in the past. And I was just what? like, what are we doing? Why do why do mediocre white men continue to get opportunity after opportunity? You could be a convicted sex offender, and that is not going to Stop your career advancement. The white privilege of it. That oh, is yes. Amazing. The white privilege of it is notable. The one thing else I wanted to mention about him finding work afterwards is that some of the, like, not only did he get letters from actors like James Marsden and, um, you know, a few other people, but he also got letters of support from crew members who said, not only do I stand next to Brian, but I, I would continue to work with him in the future despite all of this and which ended up happening. So it's just, it's, it sucks. It sucks that this dude was able to keep working. I don't know where he is now, but I, I hope he's not working with children. I will say that to me, this is a conversation about accountability and mm -hmm. holding, holding our friends and our community accountable, like holding our coworkers accountable. Like there has to be some, like people have to speak up and I'm glad that people are speaking up now. And I will admit that it was not a space where people, like we were not rewarding people for speaking up in the early 2000s. That was not a thing. If, again, if this episode showed anything, it's that we punished people. When people say, why don't victims of abuse speak up more? Drake Bell spoke up, went to court. The other guy admitted to it and he still had 41 people, 41 letters yeah. of support and a crowd of people supporting him versus a at the time, I think 18 year old kid. So that's why people don't speak up. I get it. However, we have to be better at holding our peers accountable and being mm -hmm. like, hey dude, uh, why in the world are you hanging out with a 15 year old? I'm gonna, I'm gonna need answers. I'm gonna need someone to tell me, I need you to explain to me the importance and the relevance of you having any kind of relationship with someone under the age of 18. Um, a, a few things I wanna add on. Um, I thought it was really interesting that the series ends with almost this montage of child stars who, um, kind of fell from grace in the public eye. And we start with a Corey Haim who was notorious. Corey Feldman to this day is like, Hey, Charlie Sheen raped this dude. Like he, to this day is like, he did it. Other people saw it. Like there are so many instances of like the people that they showed Drew Barrymore, who was allowed in clubs when she was 13 years old, Britney Spears, who we know everything that happened there. Like 
these people who had this fall of grace that were on the cover of t like um you know paparazzi magazines and shit like that all of them were exploited or abused in some way shape or form and as a society our response was to go ha look at how they're handling fame aren't they crazy aren't they like um, unprofessional or whatever. And it was just this victim blaming that as a society, we were encouraged to do that would prevent someone from speaking out. Yeah, absolutely. That, that part right there, this blaming of the victim and being like, you should have done better. And that's where I, that's where I'm actually like, we were talking about the gray earlier, gray area earlier. I feel like this is a lot of gray area in terms of where Will and Ryder sit because mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how much they knew, but I do know that Will at least was 27. So, you know, there is a lot of, I don't want to blame like Brand uh, Brandy's mom or um, any other parent who like saw something but didn't say anything. But at the exact same time, I can say you should have known better. Like, like at the end of the day, I'm always going to side with the children. And I feel yeah. like we have to ask ourselves, even as people who don't have children, we constantly feel like people who, anyone who has access to fame gets what they deserve. But when a child has access to fame, what are we doing? Like who, like why are, why should we hold them to the same standards as we do grown adults? The, uh, one of the other things I want to just throw out there is that in the Pod Meets World episode, they kind of talk about, like, writer said, I don't think this is a Hollywood problem. I think this is just, like, an issue that's everywhere. And maybe so that, you know, uh, abuse of children happens in churches or communities around the country. But, like, the the system of Hollywood is made to isolate children from parents or are you know, parental figures in a way that this documentary is able to highlight, like, hey, very few <laughs> could probably stand up for themselves or get out of a situation like this without the help of a parent or someone who cares for them, an adult that has eyes on them. Um, and so it's like, yeah, Hollywood isn't the only place this happens, but damn if it doesn't happen a lot. Well, yeah, it's not the only place that it happens, but also we have, like, again, they're talking about the fact that uh, I believe Brian Hearn was talking about child labor laws and be like, oh, we breaking child labor laws and everybody's cool with that? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like every, everyone's okay with it. Okay, cool. And this idea of people seeing violations, seeing someone get a massage, seeing someone be abused verbally, seeing someone do power plays on children or women in the workplace and all of those things and being okay with it. Like, I think we can't, like Hollywood is not the only place to which this happens, but it is a place that it happens enough that we can't address. Like, that's one of the things it's like, if we can start with Hollywood, if we can hold Hollywood accountable, then maybe we can hold other people accountable in other places because everyone has the understanding. There's, it's not lost on me that with me too coming out and exposing a spotlight yeah. on what was wrong in Hollywood, that Me Too movement was able to spread throughout and people were ha were able to say, hey, that happens in this industry as well. That happens yep. over here as well. And I think that Hollywood is not the end all be all, but it is part of a system that perpetuates. It is fine for people to be violated, for people to have their rights violated, for people to not be paid what they're supposed to be paid, for people to just constantly be taken advantage of for the sake of money. And we can't say for the sake of art because it's very clear that art is not at the forefront of these arguments. This is the, the capitalism argument that I stated at the top of the show, which is how many people didn't say anything because they were afraid to lose their job? Yeah. That's the number one reason people said why they didn't say shit was because they didn't want to get in trouble at their job. Exactly. Because people need money. And it, when your child is the breadwinner of a family, what does that mentally do to you to make you over? Like, does it require you to overlook stuff? Do you think like, oh, maybe I just don't know enough? Like, it, there's too much. That's too much responsibility for a child to have, <laughs> really. Way too, like, it's, to be honest, I'm 30 something and I feel like it's too much responsibility for me to have. <laughs> <laughs> but like that's the thing it's just, it, it is it is all tied to capitalism and patriarchy and um all of these things that allow people in power to degrade other mm -hmm. human beings and take advantage of them and i i think that's important because everyone needs to know that 
if they will do it to others, if they'll do it in other industries, if you allow them to do it to your coworker, who's what's to stop them to doing it from you? Yeah. From doing it to you. Um, really quickly, I want to talk about after the doc was released, you had said earlier, um, a lot of people, cast members who were like, oh, not only do I like this man, but I'll continue to work with him and all this other stuff. Uh, the cast of Ned, Ned's Declassified, um, after the documentary was released, I will say that the stars said that they didn't watch the video when they, or the documentary, when they released their own little live reaction, but they were like, none of that stuff was going on over here. Like, we, we he was violating other people, but we were cool. That ain't happened to us. And I was like, I think I need people to have more empathy and understand, as I said earlier, if they were doing it to someone else, then there's a good chance it was a roll of a dice that it didn't happen to you. Or maybe it did happen to someone you know, and you just made a joke out of it. So you didn't create a safe space for that person to tell you. Definitely. Like, Great talks about the fact that when Brian is caught, his dad is like, oh my God, I knew something was wrong with that man. Thank God it didn't happen to you. And Drake, the prime, the person who the lawsuit is around, didn't have the heart to tell his father. Because there yeah. was, like, again, there's, I'm not blaming him, but I will say there was no space for Drake to come sure. to his father. And we have to hold space for people to be vulnerable with us and say, hey, this is what's happening to me. Or, hey, you know that thing, that story that happened? I have my own tale. Yeah. Um, the Dan Schneider response to it all, Dan Schneider got uh, one of the what's what's the dude? Where's he from? I don't even know his name. I <laughs> some TV show that Dan produced um, clearly bought this dude out to have this interview that Dan clearly scripted. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about in terms of that uh, response video, which was just all bullshit. Like I I, I wouldn't yeah. even recommend people watch it. Dan's whole thing is basically like, you know what? I'm sorry if some people were uncomfortable, but there were a lot of other adults in the room and everyone, everything was kind of, there were studio heads around. And if so, if if I'm the problem, then all these other people are the problem essentially. And I kind of don't disagree with that. I'm not saying I excuse anything, but for Dan Schneider to say like, if I was such a problem, why was I allowed to keep going on essentially is something that we all, that's the big question. That well, is the question. So it's so funny when you say that because this is what people are talking about. Like you and I go back and forth with this all the time. We're not even back and forth. We just kind of bring it up all the time where it's like, that's how white men think. White mm -hmm. men think it can't be a problem because people are letting me do it. And if people are letting <laughs> me do it, then obviously everyone's okay with it. Yeah. And it is our responsibility as a society to start calling people out. This is what I said earlier about accountability. It is not lost on me that Dan Schneider is very much like a, uh, excuse me, there were checks and balances in place. Ain't nobody say anything so clearly. And it's like, you're forgetting the power dynamics. You're forgetting that you very proudly stated that everyone's well-being and finances were in your hand like so they they weren't encouraged or even had room to criticize you there are so many people we all have bosses or co-workers who make everyone feel uncomfortable but they also have to weigh is my well-being is putting food on my table worth standing up and saying something and in terms of um companies there are so many companies who will also be like hey I see his behavior. I wouldn't take that. But nobody on his staff is complaining. And mm -hmm. since we don't have any complaints, we can't do anything about it. And well, so I, I just one thing I just want to say, because Dan Schneider says, makes it seem like, oh, if there was a problem, people would have said anything. The documentary says that this motherfucker had like three internal investigations against him. So people like... There were people who were like, "This something's wrong. He but just kept getting this, away with it. We talk about this all the time. It's There are two things. One, it's the idea of how much money is he making us? What is the cost of doing something about the problem versus doing the right thing? And yeah. we've really moved away from doing the right thing, and we're way more focused on doing the cost-beneficial thing. 100%. So there's that. That's one of the problems. And another problem is very similar to what a lot of people in this documentary, the adults have to deal with is the idea of if I let him get away with that, what does that say about me? Yeah. If he gets in trouble for what he did, what does that say about me? What does it say about my behaviors? What does it say about what I did? And I think that that's another problem that we're having. We have a problem of people not being willing to own their part in the problem. 
And I mean, as much as people may not be completely satisfied with the Pod Meets World episode, I do appreciate that they were at least able to have the conversation where they talk about being a part of the problem and kind of reflecting on their role in it. Um, I will I, say, like, I to to that point, I think it's really important um, to say that. They said, we said in our last video, they didn't have to say anything. They didn't, like, we don't know this person. This was like, turns out they had to say something. They had to, because they were, they were actively named. Both of them were were named. They they were actively named and shown on camera. Like, we had photos of them. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Headshots and and names and descriptions were, were shared. So they did have to say something. And I think that's important to note because we were very much like, they didn't have to do this. I still think that it was good that they did this. I still think that um, it it puts them in a situation of having to explain further their, their position mm-hmm. and why they did what they did. But I think that that may encourage them to examine things a little bit closer. And we'll yeah. see if they touch on the subject again and if they are willing to unpack and kind of really discuss um, why they why they even had the video and actually be willing to answer and be be a little bit of vulnerable. I, I, I don't know if they will. I can't say if they will, yes or no, but I can say that it was not wrong of them to at least express regret of being involved in making these statements i do think that they owe drake bell an apology and i would encourage everyone to not hide in the shadows when you Mm -hmm. see something going wrong and really ask yourself if the situation that you are being shared feels inappropriate the other thing I wanted to say is that, like, I saw people commenting online, kind of really doubling down, giving uh, Will and Ryder a hard time. And I can understand their frustrations, but we have to understand that, like, <sighs> okay, um, there's a there's a Dave Chappelle comedy bit and however you feel about him that's fair but um he talks about how the me too movement and he was like you know in south africa when they were trying to abolish apartheid what they realized was like hey we can't just call out one person because one person will blame another person who said they got orders from everyone we have to put like the system on trial and not people on trial because when the system is on trial people feel comfortable speaking out and say yes i was complicit i did do this I did something that was shitty, but I, I, under the context of there was an environment that made me feel okay for that. And I may be a victim because I was influenced by that. I like there's, there's bigger conversations to happen than blaming two people who wrote a letter for their friend. And I, I'm not excusing it, but I'm just saying that that's not the problem. Really. The problem is a society that has allowed this to happen to begin with. So, no, I, I agree with you. And I love that. Um, I think that to your point and what we've been saying is we have to look at all these systems. I, I personally am keep going back to this idea of what we said earlier, where writer was like, everyone's like getting down on Hollywood and Hollywood's not that bad of a place. It's like, it's not, but we still need to call out Hollywood. We still need to protect children. Like I would say one of the, I was talking to my husband about this and one thing that this and Pod Meets World and all of these like behind the scenes things that we're learning um, is this idea of people should be protecting children more. We yeah. have to re-examine our relationship with child actors and not just trust the studios. Like what we all should know what is allowed on set Like, we should all be, like, there should be no um, time violations. Like, all of these things should be examined. Anytime a child actor is like, oh, I have a really close relationship with this person who is not my (laughs) co-star. And even if they are their co-star, just like, we should really be examining these things. And then also, in the Dan Schneider-ness of it all, I want apologies and money. I want <laughs> apology. Like it's fine yeah. to say, "Oh, I, I, I misunderstood what I was doing, and I was a really bad person, and all this other stuff." But like, you were violating people financially. You mm-hmm. were doing power plays career wise. You should, if anything, be the. This is what I'm talking about. When I want apologies, I want action. Sure. I want change. 
I want accountability. Like, it's mm-hmm. not enough to say, hey, I understand what I did was wrong. It's like, how are you correcting that problem? And I yeah. think that that's kind of the thing with Will and Ryder. It's like, you put out a podcast and you talked about how you regretted it. But according to Drake, you still haven't apologized. Like, what are you doing to make up the difference? Like, what yeah. are you doing to take accountability? And how loud is your apology compared, compared to, to your violation? And to, again, to, you can't, I, I don't know how many excuses you can make for Hollywood as a place. When you think about not just a Dan Schneider, when you think about a P. Diddy, when you think about a Lou Pearlman, like they're, entertainment unfortunately um has it's it's almost like the nba where so few people make it that those who do are so open for exploitation because they have everything to lose you know and um they these are people who are artists who just want to pursue their dreams and make a living at it and unfortunately the only way to do that at least historically was to go through these systems that would often take advantage of them and so i again it, there's just a bigger conversation probably that needs to be had about Hollywood in general. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, Speaking of, uh, as we kind of wrap this conversation up, uh, I want to talk about the book. It's a a little mini homework. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the book. uh, I'm glad my mom died by Jeanette McCurdy. Yeah. Because Jeanette McCurdy is one of these people who came out and talked about her experiences on the Nickelodeon set. She is someone who, um, kind of explored the things that were happening behind the scenes, the abuse that she experienced, and going back to the Ned's declassified kids, um, was belittled for it. Yeah. Was belittled and made fun of. Um, even Josh Peck, who is the co-star of Drake Bell and Drake and Josh, um, defended Dan Schneider and his whole relationship with this. And A, I think people, now that Quiet on the Set has come out, are being are willing to re-examine her story and kind of look a little bit closer, which I think is great. But also, I think that it's a testimony to the number of people who will say something along the lines of, well, it didn't happen to me. And I think that we can all use a lesson in empathy by reading and hearing other people's story and learning that even though it didn't happen to me, it happened to someone Sure. And I should still be upset about that. I, I'm I'm kind of still waiting for some of the other Nickelodeon uh, talent to make a comment. Like it feels weird that Keenan hasn't said anything. I, like I, it just it feels weird. Like I I you may not it may not have happened to you, but like you were clearly so close to Dan Schneider, you and Kel both that it's it's odd that you guys aren't saying anything. I don't know. I have I have my own thoughts and I'll keep them because they're just that their thoughts that there is there's no real basis. Um, but speaking of the Nancy classified kids, I think it's funny that they came out and they were very much like, oh, and it happened to us. But they also constantly talk about how they were having sex on set and they were having and they had access to alcohol and drugs and like all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, maybe the sexual violation didn't happen to you, but you absolutely were not supervised in the way that you should have been. Sure. And um this idea of so many kids like we hear very often pod meets world speak about everyone's like oh guys you were so nice and um you had really good parents and family and i just think about all of the kids especially in the last few decades who have been on disney shows who don't have that support system who don't have as good of an experience as will danielle and Ryder had and even their experience was like traumatizing from a work perspective. So I just really think that at the end of the day, we should be listening to children's stories. We should be re-examining the child, the young Hollywood system and the child actor system Mm -hmm. and making sure that we are not necessarily helicoptering, but we are paying attention to the systems that are currently in place and how they can be improved. (sighs) Yeah. You know what's so crazy, even after this whole conversation, like, there's still things about that documentary we didn't touch on. Like, for like, if you haven't watched it, like, and I know that some people might not want to, and I get that, and that's fair. Um, 
we we talked on some of the big things, but there's still so much that we didn't so even much. touch on. So like, yeah, I would encourage people who are curious to like get this firsthand information instead of getting it secondhand through us to give it a try and try watching it if it's not too triggering for you. I think about the idea of what Sav said about chasing Amy being a life raft for him and the idea that that is what he needed at the time. And now that he is older and he knows some truths behind it and it's not as great, he doesn't need it. He has other things to be the life raft. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why people are having a hard time learning about these things, these uncomfortable truths and these behind the scenes situations. It's because they don't have other life rafts. Like they don't these are up. the things that are making us happy. These are the things that give us a good feeling. And the more that you have to let go, the more you realize that you're just kind of floating, you know? Oh, heavy, <laughs> heavy episode, guys. Heavy episode. I desperately want to know what you guys thought. Uh, again, you, we got so many people reaching out to us asking us if we were going to cover credit on the set. We already had this planned, so it was already in the pipes. But the Boy Meets World, the will and writer of it all, absolutely had to be addressed. And uh, again, as of this moment, we have reached out. I haven't heard whether or not they will allow us to speak on it. I don't know if it's behind the rear window for them or if there's something that they're going to speak on at a later time. But um, we do want to encourage you guys to tell us your stories, to reach out to us if you have any questions, anything that you wanted to say about this episode or other episodes or Quiet on the Set. Um, also, if you or anyone you know needs help, contact the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Um, again, see something, say something. We want you guys to be safe out there. Guys, don't forget to turn in to Bra Meets World next week for some regularly scheduled programming. Don't forget to leave us a rating, a review on your favorite podcast platform. If you want to keep up with us, follow us on all the places, Bra Meets World. And uh, you know what, guys? Mentally, be safe. Like, there's a lot of yes. triggering shit out there. And if you need a break, take a break. Absolutely. Um, we say this all the time, but again, I think it's really important to remember that you can still dream and you can still try and you can still do good it's never too late to do good all right later bros later bros this episode of bromage world was produced by siege and edited by tony curtis bromage world is a two free tokens media production